Coming up on Chopper's Politics. Yes or no, will Northern Ireland be still here in a 10, 10 years' time? Or 20 no, years' time? I think it'll be gone in 10. It may be a grey, gloomy and even stormy week, listeners, but in politics, it's heating up. I'm Christopher Hope, The Telegraph's Chief Political Correspondent, and this is Chopper's Politics. And I say things are heating up because this week is Super Thursday, which isn't, as it might sound, some kind of sporting tournament, but the day that Britain heads to the polls. A series of local and regional elections will take the country's political temperature with some tasty showdowns. Now, bringing his expert analysis for what we should all be looking out for in the polls and what it might mean for a future general election is Martin Baxter from Electoral Calculus. He'll join me later in the show. And in its centenary week, we'll also discuss the future of Northern Ireland with author Kevin Marr. But first, let's head north and talk about Scotland, where talk of independence has once again dominated the lead-up to the elections this week. Now, barring a major upset, the SNP looks likely to win. But where will that leave the union? My Telegraph colleague and political commentator Alan Cochrane has covered many elections in Scotland including the referendum vote with me back in 2014. So I thought he'd be the perfect person to chew the fat, or maybe that should be chew the haggis, ahead of Thursday. Alan Cochran, welcome to Chopper's Politics. Great to have you on again. Who's going to win the Scottish elections? Oh, I don't, there's no doubt whatsoever that the SNP will emerge as the biggest party in the Scottish Parliament. None whatsoever. It's a shoe in what, what is at stake is whether they get an overall majority over all the other parties, which means they've got to win 65 of the 129 seats. Because so far they haven't done that in the current parliament. They, they, they were governing with the support of the Greens, and they, they need to have that majority in order to have the moral right to push for another referendum. Is that right? Well, they say they have a moral right. They say they would have a mandate. That's debatable. But they say they'll have a mandate to ask or demand that Boris Johnson's government allows them to have another referendum. That's right. How do you think the UK government might respond to that? I reported in the weekend Sunday Telegraph with their plans to spend billions on roads and rail and all sorts of things like like a new Turing exchange scheme and lending English hospital beds to clear the backlog in Scotland. These are all the thoughts they're, they're going through at the moment. If I read your piece correctly, Chris, and I always do, I mean, they're not going to do it until after the election, so it's not much good, is it? Until after, if it's not going to be done until after the election. But the point is... They, they, what they're going to do is nothing. I suspect that Boris has said he doesn't care what the uh, majority is going to be, that he's not going to do anything. Now, whether he can hold that line if the nationalists get a big majority is, is debatable. But the Sturgeon plan is not to have another referendum until 2023, maybe June 23. The other bits of the Nationalist Party, including some of our own hotheads, want to go much earlier. And even there are some uh, in the Alex Salmon Party, which we can get to in a minute if you like, who want to go for an immediate referendum, possibly an illegal referendum. Let's deal with Thursday. I mean, you've got the, the unionist voters split between Labour and the Tories. What does a good day look like for Labour and, and the Tories on Thursday? A good day, well, for a unionist like me, would be to prevent Nicola Sturgeon's SNP getting an, an overall majority and also preventing an amalgam of nationalist parties getting a, a majority. That would be a good day for me. For, for the Conservatives, a good day is to basically hold or perhaps increase slightly the 31 seats they have now in the Scottish Parliament. And as you know, they're now the second party and have been for some time in Scotland. A good day for Labour is overtaking the Tories. That's their only objective which is a fairly modest objective. They want to get above the Tories, and currently the polls are suggesting they ain't going to get there. The Tories will retain second place. What do you say to some cabinet ministers who, who told me at the weekend that they want some uh, voters in Scotland to forget party affiliation and vote for the unionist party most likely to be the SNP candidate? Do you think there should be some tactical voting, do you think, to save the union? Well, that's just very kind of your contacts to tell you that that's what we've been saying for years up here. And it suddenly dawned on some Tories in England, I suppose, that that's what they should do. Of course they should do that. 
But the trouble is, the Labour and the Liberal Democrats refused to do it. The leader of the Tory party in Scotland, Douglas Ross, and all manner of Scottish Tories have suggested to Labour and the Libs to get together to form a unionist alliance, and they won't do it. So we're stuck with a situation where the unionist vote is split three ways between Tory, Labour and the Lib Dems. It's madness, frankly. And for Labour, they've got their new leader, Anna Sawa, and he's he's doing well, isn't he, in the debates? He comes across as someone, I heard him described as a kind of disappointed school teacher with Nicola Sturgeon or something, so it sounded quite good. But he's doing well personally, but the party is still not in, in the doldrums. He's doing very well personally, but the trouble is he won't address the issues. He's, he's, he's very attractive guy, he's got a very good personality, he's a young guy, looks good on the telly, and he talks... Well, but he refuses to address the big issues, especially the issue of uh, independence. It got so bad during the Channel 4 uh, leaders' debate last week where the convener uh, said to him, look, if you don't want to talk about independence, why don't you sit down? <laughs> I mean, it was pretty... But, uh, he did, he said that to him, because Alas just wouldn't talk about independence, because he says independence is an obsession that Tories and, and the Nationalists have, but it's, it's, it's the key issue in this election as to whether there should be another referendum. How about your old pal Alex Salmond? Now, you, you wrote a book, didn't you, your, your part in his downfall in the 2014 Indy referendum. Is he cutting through? Is he is he cannibalising any of the SNP votes or is he not coming off from? I, I don't like being associated with that man. I think he's, I think he's a dreadful man. However, he, he, he was found not guilty by, the, by the judges and jury, so we better pass on on that one. The polls are suggesting he's not going to do at all well. But I, su- I suspect, well, I'm not going to say I'm an expert, as, as do many of the sophologists, that the polls are missing his vote. I think he'll get a couple of seats. I think he'll certainly be elected in the North East, which is his old stamping ground. And up there, I was talking to some uh, other uh, strategists yesterday, he's more popular in the North East of Scotland than, say, the Nicholas Sturgeon with nationalists. Why that should be is beyond me, but he is. So if he gets it, he'll get a seat there. And if he gets two or three others, he could be in a position to influence the ov- overall nationalist independence majority in the parliament. Nicola will absolutely hate that. <laughs> she will hate having to deal with Alec because they're, they have been in daggers drawn now, for, as you know, for years. So, so we could be at the weekend. This weekend, we could be seeing uh, Alba. Uh, Alex Salmon in talks with SNP and Nicola Sturgeon about giving a majority to the independence cause in the Scottish Parliament. I mean, how on earth could he ever be her deputy or something? That sounds crazy. Well, I know. It's, it, it is madness, isn't it? And the other thing that's madness is you and I who've done umpteen elections know the Thursday night vote is fantastic. You stay up all night and and then you're in the wee small hours of the morning, you might have a glass of champagne to keep you going, and then you <laughs> you write, write, write. You remember all these days. Yeah. But the, this time, we're not going to get the result overnight. In fact, the count isn't going to start properly until Friday morning. And at five o'clock at night, the counters are all going home for the tea. And so we're going to be counting on Friday, Friday, Saturday, most of Saturday, and we'd probably be lucky to get a final result by Saturday afternoon. We might, we might be able to get somebody like Sir John Curtis to project a result based on the first uh, results that come in on Friday afternoon. But it's going to be a long wait, a lot much longer than you and people like you and I are used to. What's at stake, do you think, in this election? Is it really the future of the union, as we're being told by concerned people down in London? Or is, is that overblown? I mean, given how Nicola Sturgeon is unlikely to call for a, a referendum very quickly. I'm British. My kids are British. My two daughters are living in London. I've got a, a son and grandsons living in Sheffield. I'm British. I don't want uh, borders put between me and my family, which would happen with independence, despite what the nationalists say. Britain is my home. I'm British and Scottish. But it is the future of the union, and it's it's a very important union. It's the most important union of former enemies in the world. And we were we were enemies, not not you and I, I hope, but uh, probably some of your ancestors and mine were at daggers drawn. Uh, I can bet they were. <laughs> but it, 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 it is a good union, and it works. It, it, it worked through two world wars. The union has got us through in Scotland a, a horrible pandemic. I mean, Nicola has fought a good campaign in PR terms in beating the pandemic, but it's Boris's vaccine rollout that's actually clinched it. What's the best argument for, for the union against 
the the European Union. I only ask that because, of course, I think from, as I divined it from Nicola Sturgeon's uh, interview with Andrew Marshall a week last Sunday, she thinks that you can take Scotland out of the UK and then rejoin the European Union. But I, I tweeted at some point recently about there's no way that the EU would be as generous funding-wise as the UK has been in terms of just per head funding. I mean, there's no way that would happen. Even if they did join the EU, Scots would be worse off, surely. Rejoining the EU, well, all, all we have to look at is the recent example of the EU and how it handled the vaccine rollout and how it handled the economic recovery that uh, Rishi Sunak has done uh, at the Treasury in London and how Boris and Hancock have, have handled the, the vaccines. I mean, that you don't, you don't have to uh, look at a crystal ball. Just read the book of what's happened in the last year. The UK government's done a, sm- a smashing job of rescuing the, the British and Scottish economy and the actual health of the nation through its uh, policy. If you look across the channel from where you are, not where I am, which is a bit further from me, uh, <laughs> look at the, the mess the EU has got itself into over the vaccine and over fighting the pandemic. I mean, that's the example we have, and it's not a good example. And even people like me, and I was a staunch Remainer, I'm quite glad we, we've got out and I think a lot, a lot of people are thinking that now because the EU, under its current leadership, has got very little to recommend. Is it the case, do you think, that a lot of this debate is emotive rather than practical and that people in Scotland just want the chance to be able to make their own separate choices? That, that, that was the point of Brexit. It wasn't the economic argument was pushed aside as project fear. It became a matter of controlling your own destiny. Don't you think there's a lot of sympathy for that feeling? Even Brexiteers should see that's what Nicola Sturgeon is arguing for. You could say that, but I mean, how many referendums, how many times do do we have to be asked? I mean, the the, the vote in 2014 was conclusive, and she said, and please get this right, she didn't say it's a a once-in-a-generation vote. She said it was a a once-in-a-lifetime vote. And you can remember how the referendum campaign went. It was very, very bitter at a personal level. And I don't want to go through it again. We took the decision back then, and it should stick. The problem is the SNP's entire point, isn't it, is independence. That's its goal, and everything else needs to be viewed through that prism. Oh, yes, but that's no reason why they should be allowed to inflict it upon us every time, just so they always get the result they want. We had the debate. It was a very full debate. It was run by serious politicians on their side and ours, and they lost. And you can't keep coming back to the same argument. How is she going to get Scotland into the EU, by the way? Is she going to have to have another referendum? to take Scotland into the EU if Scotland becomes independent. Well, these are all conversations for the weekend, I imagine. But just looking into Thursday, Alan Cochran, this podcast will come out on Wednesday. What's your forecast for the result of the election in the Scottish Parliament? Uh, An SNP majority, but I hope, this is a hope more than a projection, that she just falls short of an overall majority, that she falls short of the 65 seats she needs. She's got 63 just now, but I think she'll struggle to get 63. Just imagine, get, and then the extra three might come from Alex Salmond, and imagine that. Yeah, do you want to come back and cover, cover that one, John? Listen, I'll be, on the, I'll be on the first train north. <laughs> Alan Cochrane, it's been great to have you on the podcast, as ever. You take care, and good luck this week. It's a big week. Thanks very much, John. See you soon. Right, please do stay with us. In just one moment, I'll be chatting about another part of our union, where independence is always a hot topic. That's Northern Ireland, with author Kevin Marr, right after this. Hi listeners, it's Barney Gordon here, popping into this podcast to tell you all about another Telegraph series called Barney Gordon's Mad World. It's a podcast in which I chat to household names and unsung heroes about their mental health from Stacey Solomon to therapists and doctors on the front line. We talk about looking after ourselves as we heave ourselves out of lockdown and remind you that it's totally normal to feel weird. Search Mad World wherever you usually download your podcasts. And we're back. Now, this week marked 100 years since the formation of Northern Ireland. And rather than getting a letter from the Queen the country got a very personal message from Her Majesty, saying that the peace in Northern Ireland is a credit to its people, but it was a peace that can't be taken for granted. Now, the anniversary comes at a turbulent time, following the resignation last week of Arlene Foster, the leader of the Democratic Unionist Party, 
and the province's first minister. That, alongside Brexit and Nicola Sturgeon's demands for a second referendum in Scotland, is prompting renewed questions about its governance and its borders. So where will Northern Ireland be in another 100 years? Joining me to answer that question is Kevin Marr, a former special advisor to Sean Woodward, who was Northern Ireland Secretary under Labour between 2007 and 2010. And Kevin is an author of a new book looking at Northern Ireland's complicated history. Kevin Marr, welcome to Chopper's Politics. Now, your book's called What a Bloody Awful Country. Which country is it about? It's about Northern Ireland. The title is a quotation from uh, Reginald Maudling, who was, amongst other things, Edward Heath's Home Secretary in 1970, who uh, right. paid his first trip to um, Northern Ireland. And uh, on coming back to Belfast Airport after a pretty gruelling session, dealing with the kind of fracturing situation there, said to an official, for God's sake, somebody bring me a large scotch. What a bloody awful country. That obviously isn't true. He may have had a bad experience in negotiations, but Northern Ireland's a wonderful country, isn't it? Absolutely. No, absolutely. Absolutely. And it gets better all the time. The central premise of the book is that you don't think Northern Ireland has worked. Absolutely. I mean, it's subtitled Northern Ireland's Century of Division. And I think that's pretty apparent, um, not only in the last three decades of the 20th century with the Northern Ireland Troubles, but Northern Ireland was born into conflict. Northern Ireland was born into division in, in the 1920s. And, you know, the situation even between, you know, 1920 and 1922 saw 500 people killed in and around Belfast. So, so I suppose my argument, my summing up is Northern Ireland was bad at the start was bad all the way through and is still causing problems for the British state right up until, um, you know, right up until the current, the current moment. And, you know, the situation waxes and wanes a little bit, but the, the fundamental problems of Northern Ireland remain. Um, it's a divided society. It's an artificial construct. It's an economy that doesn't really work. And it's always yeah. in danger of, of rearing up and, and turning into, into something yeah. um, violent and destructive. And, and I think we've seen that with loyalist writing in West Belfast in the last couple of weeks. Of course, you live in Sheffield at the moment, but you were a special advisor to Sean Woodward when he was the Labour's Northern Ireland Secretary, 2007 to 2010. So you know the province very well. Isn't it the case, though, you said there that Northern Ireland is an artificial construct, and that is the point of Northern Ireland, that it needs to be ambiguous about borders and et cetera to keep the peace. It needs to be a fudge to work. It does. I mean, that's the entire premise of, of the Good Friday Agreement, which, it, which is a thing in, in, in multiple parts. At one remove, it's an international treaty between Britain and Ireland registered with the UN. It's, it's a deal for bringing together the various strands of political opinion, unionist, loyalist, republican, nationalist and other into a power sharing executive. It's also in part a blueprint for bringing around the peaceful reunification of Ireland because there is a proviso for what's colloquially known as a border poll, a referendum on Northern Ireland's constitutional status, which is which is a key part of the agreement and is, is really the thing that many nationalists and republicans look for in terms of their, their long-term support for the agreement. So it's a thing in many parts. There's a lot of creative ambiguity about bringing things together in Northern Ireland and people kind of overlooking and forgetting some of the very painful recent past as well and trying to sort of drive things forward. And, you know, it works and it doesn't work. So we've had 22 years since the Good Friday Agreement. The Northern Ireland Executive and Assembly has sat for roughly about half of that time. The rest of the time, there have been periodic problems and, and difficulties, which which have meant that the, the institutions don't work as they should do. But even, even then, even with this kind of forced embrace between nationalism and unionism, which is at the heart of the agreement, you know, it's still a hell of a lot better than everything that preceded it for the previous 70 years. So Northern Ireland is very difficult to govern at the best of times. And we've seen very much what happens in yeah. the worst of times as well. How would a border poll help that, do you think? Wouldn't that create more division? That would crystallise these divisions and make it even more difficult for the country to work? I mean, I think the border poll is an essential element of the Good Friday Agreement, though. That's what Republicans and nationalists are looking for. They've not stopped wanting to have... Irish reunification, they are prepared to work with the grain in terms of how that is brought about, that it's brought about by majority consent. That's what they signed up to. And that's what in, in the fullness of time they expect to see happen. Um, now, unionists clearly don't like that, won't like that. And that, that's that's understood. But we have a current situation where 
you know, a quarter of the entire population of Northern Ireland are also citizens of the Irish Republic as well. So in a sense, the boot's on the other foot at the moment. Nationalists have got to, you know, to, to kind of suck it up at the moment and, and live in a state and an arrangement that they don't particularly like. Um, but if and when there is demonstrable evidence that a border poll might see a change in opinion in Northern Ireland, if that changes, then unionists would then um, have to have to swap places effectively. And that's that can only be brought around democratically. Yeah. It, and it is very, very well signposted. I think that's the point, that this is not something where unionists are being bounced. This is, this is something that they signed up to knowing what the consequences were 22 years ago. Were you surprised by Arlene Foster's resignation? I mean, she's seen as as a moderate in DUP politics and her successor could well be less moderate. Do you think things might get worse before they get better? I think Arlene Foster uh, has struggled for a period of years anyway. I think one of the missing dimensions you know, in the, in the last 10 years in Northern Ireland politics has obviously been the death of Martin McGuinness and the resignation and retirement from frontline politics of Peter Robinson. Now, what, what you had with McGuinness and Robinson, you know, people that had both been involved for very many years in their respective communities, and they had credibility and they could represent their base and they could do deals and they could they could turn up for work and they could move things forward. It wasn't perfect by any means, but it was an awful lot better than anything we've seen since. Arlene Foster's difficulty is that she didn't have that form and she was a blow in, as, as many DUP hardliners saw it from the from the Ulster Unionist Party. And she didn't have the credibility, I think, with the grassroots. And I think that that's got worse in terms of fallout from Brexit and obviously the advent of the Northern Ireland Protocol, where where she's not seen to be tough enough to defend and hold the line. So I think there was going to be problems coming for Arlene Foster come what may. I'm not surprised that eventually there has been this uh, this palace coup and she's been pushed out. I think what may happen is that you get Edwin Poots next week as the as the new leader of the DUP. And I think what may happen here with Poots is that he talks right and moves left where I don't think Arlene Foster could do that. She had to kind of touch him with a base on a very regular mm. basis. Yes. And they did, yeah. I think the bottom line is they didn't trust her. Yeah. I think they will trust Poots, and that may give him some freedom to do yeah. some of the things that he feels he might need to do. Uh, Kevin Moore, as earlier you said, of course, this week is the centenary of the creation of Northern Ireland. Do you think in 100 years Northern Ireland will still be here, or is a united Ireland an inevitability? Well, I've written another book about... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Northern Ireland, inevitable reunification. So I'm kind of, I've kind of got form there. You so um, Yeah, I, I don't think, I don't think Northern Ireland will last an awful lot longer. I think it's a bit hard to put a precise date on it, but I think you can see a constellation of factors that are in play, which will push us towards the proviso in the Good Friday Agreement for a border poll. I think, I think we can see that in terms of the demographic changes, which are likely to be reflected in this year's census with probably a tilt towards broadly the Catholic nationalist community being in the ascendant, which of course is significant because Northern Ireland was created in 1921 as a Protestant unionist fief. Six counties of the historic province of Ulster, the other three with a Catholic majority, which would have meant that um, Northern Ireland wasn't sustainable. They were cut off and, and what have you. So anyway, there's, there's demographic changes. We can see it, I think, in terms of the political results as well. You know, Sinn Féin in the last assembly elections, one seat behind the DUP, 1,100 votes. It was very, very close. Sinn Féin may top the poll in the next assembly elections. And there's already talk that Poots might be looking to try and have a quick election in the late summer, early autumn. So that may happen. So, so, so you can start to see these kind of indicators of support for a change in the constitutional firmament and that being tested then in a border poll. Now, it may be, it may be that that result in a border poll is quite close. And some people say, look, there should be a super majority. There's no point having a, a very close result if unionists are very, very unhappy with the outcome. But of course, that's kind of Brexit for you, really. Um, mm. If 52% is good enough for Brexit, and if 50.5% was good enough for the creation of the Welsh Assembly, then a result in the 50s seems to be um, perfectly safe to proceed with. So I think that will happen. I think that border poll is coming. I think there's an enormous amount of chatter right across politics in Northern Ireland and in the South as well about um, Irish unity, the, the main political parties in the South starting to talk about this in earnest in a way that they've never done before. They've been quite happy to just kick the can down the road. But of course, the performance of Sinn Féin in the Irish general election last year uh, I mean, has changed everything. And, and you know, it's not being seen as a flash in the pan because every poll subsequently has Sinn Féin either leading the pack in Dublin or in a very close second place. So, so the other parties are starting to calibrate all that and what that means. 
And you're seeing, I think, a greening of the Dublin establishment in terms of looking at the national question. And of course, if you ended up with a situation where the Irish government fell, and it's a pretty loveless marriage at the moment between Fianna Fáil and Fine Gael, which are historic political opponents, uh, and the Green Party, it's a pretty vociferous uh, grouping. If there was a change that down down south, and if Sinn Féin ended up in government there, which is now you know a, a pretty much a racing certainty, and if um, Sinn Féin topped the poll in the north, which again is looking increasingly likely, the demands and and, and the optics of change in in Northern Ireland would would I think be quite stark. So I think we'll get to that border poll. It then becomes a question of. In the parlance of eBay, is the buyer willing to collect? Because, of course, there needs to be a concurrent referendum in the South about that as well. And, and, you know, all opinion polls there show significant majority in favour of unification. And then it becomes a question for Westminster. And and this, for me, is is always the, the interesting issue. Northern Ireland is going to take up a lot more time in Westminster than it has done in recent years. I think people in both parties, for perfectly legitimate reasons, coast on the achievements of the Good Friday Agreement. But I think, it, you know, as I say, this this proviso for a border poll is coming up and it's going to it's going to involve Westminster having to make some pretty big decisions and get some big positioning right. Because I think if, if Dublin starts to indicate, yes, it's supportive of it as well, then the pressure is on, you know, possibly the next government to accede to this border poll. Or we could see not a return to the troubles, but we could cert- we'll, we'll certainly see a major political crisis if a British government, for example, simply refused to engage with the prospect of a border poll. I don't think they well, would. I mean, extraordinary tour de force forecasting, setting out where we might be going in Northern Ireland. Of course, the unionists would have a lot to say about all that. Really? Just finally, yes or no, will Northern Ireland be still here in a 10 years time or 20 yeah, years time? I think it'll be gone in 10. Kevin Marr, author of What a Bloody Awful Country. We'll put links to how to buy that book in the show notes for this episode. Thanks again for joining us this week on Chopper's Politics. Thank you. Thank you. Now, it's Democracy in Action this week. We've already covered Scotland and Northern Ireland, and there's more to play for south of the border as well. Can the Prime Minister muster the same momentum that swept him to power in 2019? Or will the COVID-19 crisis and Mr Johnson's curtains stop that march in its tracks? It's also the first real test for well over a year for Labour figures like Sir Keir Starmer, the leader, London Mayor Sadiq Khan and First Minister of Wales, Mark Drakeford, who will all be able to see what voters think of how they've handled the pandemic and the response to it. So I thought I'd ask Martin Baxter, polling expert from Electoral Calculus, what we should expect. Martin Baxter from Electoral Calculus. Welcome back to Chopper's Politics. Great to have you on. Uh, great to be back, Chris. Nice to speak to you. Absolutely. Now, listen, you did some polling for the Sunday Telegraph this weekend about the upcoming Super Thursday elections. What did you find out? Yes, this was an interesting poll. So we did, uh, working with the pollsters Find Out Now, we surveyed uh, quite a big sample of over 10,000 people doing what's called in the trade an MRP poll. And that's a poll that gives you more geographic information. And we surveyed people in all the 123 English district councils, which are up for election this Thursday, to ask them how they plan to vote. And it was interesting what results came back, because on the whole, the voters are still sticking in many ways with the Conservatives that according to the poll, the Conservatives might even uh, gain councils in the election this week, might gain a dozen or so councils. Labour might also gain a few, particularly from no overall control. If that result actually happens, that would be very good for the Conservatives at this stage of the cycle, because they're you know, a year and a half into the Parliament. They've been 11 years in government. They've been you know, a little bit beset by sleaze allegations in the last couple of weeks. So You would naturally expect if Labour were doing well, that they would be taking wards and votes and councils off the Conservatives election after election. But they're not doing that, it seems, from the polling you've looked at so far. So what are your net gains and losses across the three main political parties this Thursday? Where are you at the moment, Martin? So central prediction in terms of number of councils is the Conservatives could gain 13 councils, up from 27 to 40. Labour could gain six councils, up from 52 to 58. Because on the whole, these are generally, there's quite a lot of Labour areas that are up for election this time. Lib Dems might gain one, and no overall control where councils are split is kind of the potentially the main loser there. The important thing is the relative gain is that the Conservatives might gain more than Labour. And at this stage of the cycle, that would certainly be a good result for them. 
That's extraordinary. And how many actual seats are you forecasting in hundreds rather than number of councils gained or lost? Sure. So there's about six and a half thousand seats. Currently, both Conservative and Labour, we're predicting might gain about 300 seats extra. So they both gain. Some of that's a bit illusory because there are three new councils that didn't exist before. So there's technically 250 new seats. And that, that to me just shows how the, the expectation and management game is in full swing because I've been told by senior people in number 10 to expect over a 1,000 losses for the Tories, for example. And if they gain 300, that's quite a result for them. To what extent, Martin Baxter, do you think that the lockdown has meant people are more focused on local issues in, in these elections in the sense that everyone's been sitting at home or a lot of people are sitting at home working, watching the local services come and go as they have to and watching that pothole in the road getting bigger? Are people more attuned to local issues in these elections than normal? Well, I think that's a good question about what's driving people this election. And so those local issues uh, may well be important, though we, we do have to remember that local elections are often a bit of a proxy vote for Westminster. But what's happening is, I think, really, there's kind of two forces colliding. One is the government has had a good management of the COVID crisis recently, particularly with the vaccine that's helped them. The sleaze allegations that Labour have been running with are maybe doing something at the margins, but they're not making a big impact so far. And the other one is we're seeing is, is the dog that's not barking is Brexit, that we're seeing in the details of the polling returns that Brexit is much less of a motivator of people's voting opinions than it was at the general election 18 months ago or so. Also, class is a bit less of a, an important one. And this may be important for later. The Conservatives on our numbers are not making any further inroads into the Red Wall, into that big block of, of Labour area between sort of Merseyside and South Yorkshire. Labour seem to be safe there. They're not losing ground there as far as we can see. The Conservatives are sort of doing well up to about the Midlands, maybe Derbyshire, so that some of the forces we saw at the general election seem to have stabilised and aren't going any further forward. Apart from probably Hartlepool. So we've got, we have a poll overnight, don't we? A salvation poll on Tuesday forecasting a, a Tory gain, which would be extraordinary in Hartlepool in the by-election. Yes, it would. I, I'm old enough to remember the days where Vincent Hanna would be sent off by the BBC to various by-election sites where some strange <laughs> result would happen. Where he's Mac, in his dirty Mac. Oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> and quite a lot would be in, tried to be inferred from that result. I personally think that Westminster by-elections are a little bit of a mugs game to get predictions from, though equally it will be a psychological victory if the Conservatives can do it. Hartlepool's a council even is quite strange because there's a lot of independence, there's strong independent voices in Hartlepool. So, it's a, a particularly difficult one both to predict and to interpret the result. Right. Meralty. Now, I'm told in Teesside, Ben Houchin is doing quite well and because there's the big Freeport coming up there and maybe Andy Street might squeak it in West Midlands, but maybe not Sean Bailey in London. I mean, mayoral elections are very, are certainly very local, uh, very personality driven. So you've got to poll there directly. We have done direct polling in both the West Midlands and London. On the West Midlands, yes, uh, Andy Street looks clearly ahead on the the first votes because uh, um, let's remember in these mayoral elections, people get two votes. The second vote counts if, if their first choice candidate isn't going to win, it gets redistributed. So Andy Street's well ahead on the first votes and is ahead by I think it's about three or four percent on the second vote. So again, it was is going to be a very close election in the West Midlands as it was the last time round, but he seems to be ahead if not streets ahead, if I can put it that way, he's uh, a few houses ahead. In London, all the polling evidence, ours and everybody else that I've seen suggests a, a big victory for Sadiq Khan. And of course, the big question that everyone will be asking us at The Telegraph, and my news editor will be saying this to me on Friday and Saturday, what do the results mean for a general election? Now, the results haven't happened yet, but on your forecast, where are we if, if your forecasts come true when it comes to a general election? Well, looking at the, the polling for Westminster voting intention, that's remained fairly stable over the month, actually, despite everything that's gone on about wallpaper and who likes John Lewis more. <laughs> the Conservatives are still about 6% ahead of Labour, which would translate into a you know working, if not massive, majority for them around 24 seats. So they are doing OK. I would say if the districts come out the way that we think they might – and that's going to be a good psychological boost for the Conservatives and a bit of loss of momentum for Labour. So that will sort of put back their efforts to, to become the government. And it's a bit early yet, but obviously 
there's not going to be a general election next year, but I suspect if things continue to go well, the Conservatives might begin to think about penciling a general election in for spring 2023, which would be three and a half years after the last one. So the clock is ticking for Labour, I think a little bit more maybe than people think. And if Labour get a good district council result, then that will really help them. But again, if if they're set back, as the figures look like they might be, then they've got still quite a high hill to climb and not so long to climb it in. Martin Baxter there, excellent analysis as ever from Electoral Calculus. And in the show notes for this episode, we'll put a link to Martin's findings. So thank you, Martin. Thanks, Chris. Well, that's all for this week. I'd love to hear your thoughts on some of the topics we've spoken about today. You can email us. We're at chopperspolitics at telegraph.co.uk or find us on Twitter. We're at Chopper's Podcast. And my dog-loving producer, Louisa Wells, would love to see your pictures of your dogs waiting patiently while you vote outside polling booths. Always a favourite on election day. Please tweet us at dogs at polling stations and please tweet us at Chopper's Podcast. Another way of letting us know what you think is by leaving a rating and a review on Apple Podcasts. This week, Emerald did just that. And she said that my sense of fairness and balance shape the show, but never overpower it. You're making me blush, Emerald. Not green, but red. Thank you, Emerald. Reviews like that really help other people find this podcast. We really appreciate it. Please keep leaving them. Thank you to my guests this week, Alan Cochran, Martin Baxter, and Kevin Marr. Thank you to my producers, Elliot Lampitt, Louise Wells, and of course, Theo Luludis. But most importantly of all, thank you to you for listening. Podcasts like this one couldn't be made without the support of Telegraph subscribers. Now, if you're not one already, and we do have more than 600,000 of them, listener, want to head to telegraph.co.uk forward slash chopper to get your first month completely free of charge because, well, who doesn't love a freebie? And finally, please do buy a copy of The Daily Telegraph. You won't regret it. Until next time, though, cheerio!